YouTube, it's Dave Wade from the Big Fish Network, and today I'm gonna talk about two play additions over the last few days that the Miami Dolphins made. Mike McDaniel and Chris Greer not wasting no time adding talent to the roster that fit the coach's vision. And according to Adam Scheffner, the Miami Dolphins signed former Packers fullback John Lovett, and I love it, and former Eagles defensive end Deshaun Hall, who I think can be an explosive play on defense for us and fit into that rotation. Now, both of these players are names that most of the fans never heard of, including myself. This is my first time hearing about these players, but I watched tape of both of these players and I love what I saw. And I love these two signings. I love the thinking and the direction of these moves. And I can see how both of these players can be used, loving on offense and hard on defense. And it kind of reveals a small glimpse of the strategy that we might use this season. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about that in this video, and I'm going to cover free agency coming up soon. So y'all make sure and hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell so you can hear it first. Now, I'm going to start with John Lovett, the fullback from the Packers, who signed a one-year deal with us. He's six foot three, 225 pounds, and he went undrafted in the 2019 draft and got signed by the Kansas City Chiefs. Andy Reid tried him at H-back and tried him at the tight end spot. And, you know, he flashed, he flashed at camp, but he ended up getting hurt. And the Chiefs placed him on season in the injured reserve. He was then waived by the Chiefs on July 29th, 2020, and landed with the Packers after the team claimed him, claimed him on waivers. Uh, he settled in the practice squad role early in the season, ended up getting elevated to the active roster in weeks one and two earned a promotion to the 53-man roster. So he worked his way on the team, and then he ended up you know, playing the eight games total, but he suffered a torn ACL during practice around mid-season and finished the year on injured reserve with the Packers as well. So when we bring him in, hopefully our strengthening and conditioning coach can find out the areas that he needs to improve in in the weight room, get him stronger so he can stop getting hurt. Because because I'm telling y'all, don't underestimate this signing. I really think that John Lovett can be a dangerous player for his own offense if we use him the right way. And the fact that they even signed him shows me, like I said, what Mike McDaniel might be thinking as far as what, uh, uh, how he can utilize him in this scheme and in different schemes, you know, for, for our attack. Now, uh, he's different from Kyle Jusek. I know y'all see that. You know, we added him, and y'all think he's going to be like Kyle. I actually think he can be better than Kyle, as you said, if we use him the right way. Because if you YouTube John Lovett from the Packers, you're not going to find a lot of videos on him. Even if you do it with the Kansas City Chiefs, look up his Princeton Tigers videos, and you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, as far as the Packers... He didn't do much on offense, but he did make four special teams tackles. So you could, we could we also use him on special teams in the kicking game. He returned one kickoff for five yards, carried the ball uh, three times for six yards, late in the blowout win over the 49ers. But that's pretty much about it. Uh, but he can be an all-purpose fullback. And if you look through the years at the teams that's been successful, like Bill Belichick, Andy Reid, I think Bill Belichick runs variations of the West Coast system. And the reason why I say that is because if you look at his rosters through the years, Belichick has always, for the most part, kept at least one fullback, and most times he's kept two fullbacks. Where does he get that from? Don Shula. Don Shula, if you look through the rosters, he's usually kept two fullbacks on the roster. Why? Because one fullback is going to be a blocking fullback, the other fullback is going to be an all-purpose fullback or receiving fullback. And Bill Belichick is probably one of the only coaches that still does that. And y'all wonder why. It's little hidden things like that. It ain't just Tom Brady. It ain't just the, the number, you know, a top 10 defense. It's the fact that he knows how to utilize certain players that you wouldn't expect on offense and defense to make plays, even if there's just a few plays a game, or even if it's just a few plays or a handful of plays a season, 
there are plays that impact the game that contribute to winning and contribute to Super Bowl. And so you gotta have those players, those 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 utility players that make a difference on your team. Jim Jensen, tight end Jim Jensen. Really, he was probably one of the first Swiss Army Knight players, Jim Jensen, that surely used that nobody ever talks about when it comes to Dan Marino. All you talk about is Mark Duper, Mark Clayton. Nobody talks about uh, Jim Jensen. No one talks about Nat Moore. No one talks about these players. Keith Byers. No one talks about, uh, you know, Tony Page. Players that made plays for Marino when it wasn't open downfield. We had, you know, his, his running backs and fullbacks and tight ends and different type of players that he can use, that Shula can use underneath to make that shit open downfield. So you need players like that. And, you know, I, I want us to be a hybrid type of offense. I want us to be a hybrid offense, similar to how the defensive philosophy is, where we can morph from a 3-4 to a 4-3 pre-snap. I want us to do the same thing. I want us to be able to start off in a split back, shotgun set, and pre-snap, switch to the Wildcat, or switch to an uh, 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 I-form set, or switch to far and near, all within that. And you can do that, because you got split backs in the backfield. So in a split back set, that could turn into a pistol formation. You can do that pre-snap if you have the right players to be able to do that. So if you got an all-purpose fullback who can catch out in the backfield, who has good hands, hasn't dropped a lot of balls, you know, who can, you know, be a, a running threat, a power running threat that you can you can run on plays that the defense can least expect it. That's the thing about the fullback is. You gotta, you use the fullback when they least expect it. When they're looking for the running back to get the ball. When they're looking for you to pass to the H-back or to the tight end, you got the full, you got the fullback who you can run on angle routes, you can run on circle routes, you can run on flares, you can motion them out to the left or the right side, you can motion, you know, in the slot, you can motion them far out wide and have your receivers in the slot. So but you can only do that with an all-purpose fullback. And he has to have good hands, good agility, good ability. And I think that uh, John Lovett can do all of those things. I mean, you look at uh, what he did at Princeton with the Princeton Tigers in the FCS in 2016. They used him like Taysom Hill. He threw 77 passes for 10 passing touchdowns, only two picks, and had 20 rushing touchdowns. And them 20 rushing touchdowns is what earned him the, uh, the, the the Bushnell Award for the Offensive Player of the Year. Them 20 rushing touchdowns. He was a dual threat. The following year, they used him as a primary quarterback. Just like how Sean Payton tried to do with Taysom Hill the last year. He, he had him competing with Jameis Winston, but best believe uh, Sean Payton wanted Taysom Hill to win that job and be better than Jameis Winston because he wanted to be able to use Taysom Hill in a variety of different ways. It's just Taysom Hill don't have the accuracy that Jameis Winston has. He can't have, he don't have the downfield accuracy throwing the ball deep like how Jameis Winston has. So you, you lose some of that, but when you see him utilizing a two quarterback system with Jameis Winston and Taysom Hill, you can't be discouraged by that. That don't mean that Jameis Winston is a bad quarterback and they have to use Taysom Hill. That's a part of the attack. That's, that's what, that's, I like that. And even with Drew Brees, they use Taysom Hill passing and receiving and running, and we can do that with John Lovett. Um, like I said, when they used him in 2017 as a primary quarterback, he was running a lot of RPO plays. Y'all gonna see that on tape. He ran a lot of RPO plays, and just the fact that he's a fullback in the NFL, who played quarterback, who can run RPO, man, that's, that's ridiculous. We already got two of running the RPO to perfection, and they can't stop it. I know a lot of fans tired of seeing him watch the, run the RPO, but that should be one part of the attack. Again, I want us to have a hybrid attack. The RPO is one part of it. Us adding this fullback or all-purpose fullback, that's another attack. 
that we can use on defenses and teams to keep them honest and to get yards and gash them and get touchdowns. Um, but his game against Monmouth was one of his best games. He went out for 21, for 27 uh, attempts. 27 completions, 327 yards passing with five passing touchdowns that game. Plus, he had 77 rushing yards and a touchdown that game. The man gave you six touchdowns himself, uh, running and passing. The whole year, you saw him throw with good touch and accuracy at times. And like I said, he won the Bushnell Award twice. Back-to-back -back offensive player of the year at, at two different positions. He did it all. Uh, the Princeton coaches, they loved him. All the players loved him. He was a leader on that team. He led them to the championship. Um, and he was the captain. You know, he, they, he was competitive in the locker room. Some of the players say, no matter what, it, whatever, whatever the game they was playing, ping pong, chess, it don't matter, drawing straws. He's competitive. He wants to win. That's the kind of player that I want on our team. He raised the level of all his teammates in like I said, the first NFL player comp that comes to mind when you look at his tape is Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill, six foot two, two twenty one, and you know he was able to do a lot of the same things. Patrick Pass from the Patriots. I don't know if y'all remember a lot of uh, fans who remember the two thousands of the Patriots. Patrick Pass was a fullback that he reminds me of as well. Again, another player who. When you think of Tom Brady, all you think about is Randy Moss, uh, Rob Gronkowski. You think about some of the other players he had, Deion Branch, Troy Brown. You don't think about other players that Bill Belichick used, like Kevin Falk, fullback Patrick Pass. He and Patrick Pass played running back, quarterback, receiver, and kick returner at the University of Georgia. Uh, before his freshman season, he got drafted by the Florida Marlins in the 1996 Major League Baseball Draft. So we almost had him on the Florida Marlins for us. And he played that summer in our farm system. He played again in the Marlins minor league system before his sophomore and junior seasons in 1997 and 1998. Why do I mention that? Why is that important? Because Patrick Pass was used as a kick returner by the Patriots as well. A fullback as a kick returner. Because him playing baseball, he got that ability to track the ball in the air. So that's why Bill Belichick used him in that role. Again, that's great coaching. Mike McDaniel, hopefully, and, and from what I see with us acquiring him on the team, hopefully he uses him in that role and he has that, that mindset to use players for all the abilities that they could possibly have to help this team. Um, but... You know, when you look at Patrick Pass, 2005, his 2004 and 2005 seasons are, are good examples of how you can use uh, an all-purpose fullback in today's game. To me, the best all-purpose fullback ever is, is Roger Craig, and, it, and he's a unicorn. We can find something like that in the draft, which... There's times where we've been able to possibly do that. We just ain't never think like that. Like, I think Caleb Village could have been a fullback at 235. You know, I was watching uh, Dudley Duron uh, talk about this acquisitions that we made, and he talked about Patrick Laird being a, a possible fullback for us. I think Patrick Laird is a little bit too small. If he was maybe 230, if he put on some pounds, then yeah, but he's a little bit too small. I would actually cut Patrick Laird. Even though he's made plays for us, I think he's filling a roster spot that can be utilized for a player who has different skill sets than what Patrick Laird has. I think it's a log jam at running back right now with Ahmed, him. They are around. He's a, he's bigger than them, but he knows that he, he he doesn't do enough to me to validate a roster spot. I think a guy like Lovin who can also pass can fill that spot that Patrick Laird is, 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 is taking up right now. But, uh, but back to Patrick Pass. The man had 36 kickoffs for 745 yards as a fullback. 2005, he had 245 rushing yards that season, had a hamstring injury and ended up getting hurt. And when you look at his stats, uh, 
2000, the Foley played in 14 games, had 39 rushes for 139 yards. No touchdowns, but he had eight rushing first downs. Longest run play was a 19-yard play. Receiving, he had 32 targets. So Brady targeted him 32 times, 28 wrecks, 217 wreck yards, seven passing first downs. 2005, he played in 12 games, 54 rushes, 245 yards, three touchdowns, 13 rushing first downs, averaged 20 yards per game, and his longest run was 31 yards as a fullback. He had 30 targets for 22 wrecks, uh, 227 yards, and zero passing touchdowns, but he had eight first down, and his longest play was 39 yards. So that 39-yard play could have led to a win. You know, and when you break down these yards in a 16-game season, that's basically a first down a game. That first down could have made the difference in the Patriots losing that game or winning that game. Uh, so, you know, those are some things to consider. Those are some things to think about, and those are some things to get excited about. Y'all leave a comment. Let me know what y'all think about us adding a, a versatile a fullback, all-purpose fullback to this team. The next player I'm going to talk about is defensive end Deshaun Hall, the 6'5 edge rusher. Uh, you're not going to find a lot of video of him as well. Uh, and that's the thing that I like. Chris Greer, you could tell him, the Marvin Allen, the scouts, they be digging. They dig and they find hidden gems that these coaches, if they just open their mind and use some of these players, you know, I, I can see sometimes why some of the general managers and scouts be pissed off because sometimes the coaches don't utilize the players. We need to utilize these players. But Deshaun Hall, no tape. But if you look at his NFL experience, he played uh, for the Carolina Panthers. He played for the San Francisco 49ers. We didn't play for him, but he was on their roster. Um, he did play some games for the Eagles. But, you know, that's, that's he, he doesn't really have a lot of tape in the NFL. But you look at his college tape, he was impressive at Texas A&M his senior year, followed by an equally impressive performance at the NFL scouting combine, ran a 4.76 second, 40, had a 36-inch vert, and he got 35-inch arms. The Carolina Panthers were so blown away by him that you know, they ended up plucking him in the third round in the 2017 draft. He played in just one game with the Panthers as a rookie, played nine snaps in the season opener, spent the next three games as a game day inactive, then was placed on injured reserve for the rest of the year with a hamstring injury. After that, they cut him. Um, he, he didn't have a good training camp in preseason with the Panthers. So he got picked up by San Francisco, and that's probably how Mike McDaniel's familiar with him because he was on the practice squad a week after Carolina released him. The biggest problem with Hall is that he wasn't strong enough, you know, in the lower body. He wasn't strong enough, and for an edge rusher, he weighed, for an edge rusher, he weighed just a bag of chips, which was 260 pounds coming out of Texas A&M. And he played on the opposite side of Miles Garrett. So ended up getting, you know, having good production, benefiting from Miles Garrett on that as a bookend on that other side. But he a skinny 260. And I, to me, he'd be better getting up to maybe 270, 275 with improved leverage and lower body strength, like I said. Uh, a lot of college edge rushers, when they come out, when they come to the NFL, one of the things, they, some of the things they struggle with is handling the strength and the agility of some of these offensive tackles. These offensive tackles are all athletic. They can move, and a lot of times they're not they, they're not ready to handle all of that. You know, you think of Charles Harris. He struggled with us. Uh, you know, he wasn't able to take advantage of his spin move that he used real good at Mizzou. That didn't work too well in the NFL. That's why he wasn't getting a lot of pressures. There was times when he was almost getting there, but he wasn't getting a lot of sacks. And, you know, he's doing better now with the Lions, but while he was on the squad, a lot of the fans wanted us to try moving him to linebacker to a 3-4 linebacker, but he he don't he's not good in coverage as a linebacker. That's why we didn't switch him to linebacker. But when he got to the Niners, when Deshaun got to the Niners and picked up, 
uh, and got cut and got picked up by the Texans. He dropped nearly 20 pounds, and then they moved him to linebacker during his nearly three months with them. Uh, three weeks after that, uh, he ended up getting uh, he ended up getting uh, uh, three weeks after that, the Houston Texans signed him to their 53-man roster. And he was only a 53 man for three games, none of which he played in. Then he was released and signed to their practice squad in mid-December. Then the Eagles signed him. So he's he's been a journeyman. He's been moving around. He played in the Eagles' final two regular season games and both uh, playoff games where he played 16 defensive snaps in the Eagles' week 16 and 17 wins over Houston and Washington, registering his first NFL sack and that 32-30 win over the Texans. And then he was used on special teams and playoff games against Chicago and New Orleans. Um, now they got Jim Swartz, who was calling that defense for the Eagles, and they strength coach wanted him. They told him if he, had, if he wanted to have a shot at really making the roster he needed to get in that weight room and get on a different regimen. And he ended up packing on a solid 30 pounds and got a lot stronger. And I think, you know, with him getting stronger like that, he can be in that 3-4 rotation with Emmanuel Ogba and Van Ginkle. And I think he can replace uh, Brendan Scarlett on this team, who I, I like on special teams, but he's not explosive enough. Uh, to, and, and to me, he got, he got kind of low upside. I think he's kind of plateaued as a defensive player. He, he's just really, a, a great special teams player. He has a lot of energy. I think he's a great leader on the team, but he's taking up a roster spot. Uh, plus, Scarlett, Brennan Scarlett's 28, and Deshaun Hall is, is 26. Y'all know I'm a proponent of under 28. If they 28, they got to be real good for us to keep them and give them a three-year contract or one year or two-year contract, something like that. They got to be real good. They got to be better than the waiver wire players, better than the draft picks for us to keep them on this team. I want us to stay young and build sustained success, just like how we said we was going to do on the Flores. I want us to continue that, like I said, with Mike McDaniel. Um, but I see potential in Deshaun. If he could just stay mentally strong, he kind of got discouraged from being cut. And a lot of players go through that, but he got to stay strong, work hard. I think Josh Boyd can develop and fit, and fit him into this offense. And, you know, there's a lot of potential there. So y'all let me know what y'all think about these two signings. Let me know if y'all think these are good moves or other players y'all think that we should also add who's going to get cut or who got cut. Uh, in the meantime, y'all stay focused. Stay warm out there if it's cold. Stay tuned in to the channel. I love the support. I'm glad that I got the subscribers that I have. I'm trying to grow this channel. I want to get more subscribers. Y'all click that like button, like I said. Till next time, signing off. TBFN.